Hey guys, welcome to the Challenge Podcast. I'm Coach Steve. And I'm Coach Nick. And we're going to be talking about everything fitness, health, and the challenge. Let's get on with the show. What's up, guys? Coach Steve here. and Welcome back to another episode of the Challenge Weekly Show. Today, I'm joined with our co-host, Coach Nick. Nick, how are we doing today? I am so good, Coach Steve. How are you? I'm really good. I'm really good. And of course, like always, I'm really excited because this week we are in week seven, Nick. We are now into that second phase of the challenge, you know, part two of this uh, 12 week challenge. And, you know, arguably this, this second phase of the challenge is probably more challenging. You know, the first half of the challenge is always really excited. We're full of motivation. We're full of inspiration. You know, it's like that you know, we've just been, just got married and we're in that honeymoon period. Everything is blissful and amazing. And then, you know, in week seven, that's when that kind of motivation starts to dissipate. The inspiration goes away and, you know, you start seeing your partner do those weird things and you're like, why did I marry this person? So now <laughs> we're in week seven um, and that's the, the tail end of the challenge. That's when things, you know, really start to, to heat up, get challenging. Um, and then that's also the time where we start to see these really amazing results come through. So my quick tip is just to stay driven, stay focused, and you know, keep on getting through over this next six weeks. Yeah. And don't end up on the front cover of Who Weekly being divorced from the challenge after six weeks. <laughs> Yes, yes. And look, one way to think about it is if you continue to work hard on this challenge, you know, we're six weeks in, we're over halfway, you know, there's, there's no point giving up now, right? It's like, you know, getting halfway through a marathon and you're like, well, I, I, I'm done now, you know, we're, we're on the other end of it. And it's all about just keep on grinding through, get through those, those couple of hard weeks, because I tell you now, like, this moment right now is probably the the hardest, right? Like in that little slump bit. Because once we get closer to the end, we kind of get that, you know, second win that comes into us. We're like, yeah, okay, it's only, you know, two weeks away or three weeks away. I can do this. I can do this. But at the moment, if it's six weeks away, it's like, ah, it's just a little bit far. It's, okay, you're going to have to dig deep and, you know, work hard towards achieving what you set out to achieve. Yeah. And sometimes the the final photos are just that little bit too far away for, to worry about so much but they do creep up on you so every single day has to be with a purpose towards those as well so think of it like that yeah absolutely uh, I do think it's worth you know reflecting on like why you chose to do the challenge right we all have our own reasons why we we did it maybe we want to uh, lose a little bit of body weight maybe we wanted to build some muscle maybe we wanted to look good naked or to improve our confidence whatever it is you know it's probably worth now reflecting on why you chose to start the challenge and use that reason why to to drive you over the next six weeks mm -hmm. exactly exactly and write it down if you haven't you know re revisit it. it it could have changed that's okay as well yeah. Yeah. Um, I also think it's worth thinking about the end point, you know, like when we do get to that week 12, if you project yourself six weeks from now, you know, really think about like, what's, what's the end point going to be? Like imagine yourself with that six pack or imagine yourself being able to squat a hundred kilos or, or deadlift, you know, a hundred kilos or whatever your goal is, right. If, like think about that end point and keep that end point in mind. And, you know, you can kind of reverse engineer that end point a little bit, but, you know, having that clear vision, that light at the end of the tunnel can help us kind of like keep driving towards the end goal. Absolutely. And I do think that um, the, the last point I'll make here about kind of getting through that week f uh, seven slump that, you know, that, that, that middle of the challenge slump is to find ways to enjoy the journey, right? And often when we are looking at dieting or changing our body composition, it's, it's really driven in like, you know, that go hard or go home mentality, you know, that, that you know, uh, no pain, no gain. It's all about like that, that grunt that, you know, that, that just suffering that you almost need to have and that's not always the case like we don't always need to suffer in our weight loss journey and part of it is to find ways to enjoy the journey and maybe it is looking at the non-scale victories like we're going to go through today or maybe looking at those small wins in the gym like oh yeah like I can bench press a little bit more or a few more reps this week than I did last week or wow these clothes are fitting nice and loose towards me or you know dabbling in the kitchen and how you are making foods and preparing foods being like oh wow I can now make this type of meal which is really tasty and I can enjoy this and it's good for my total caloric goal so finding ways to enjoy the journey can help us to you know not lose that that motivation or that determination to get to the end you know that that can that can go away if we are just going rough and tough with it so find ways to enjoy the journey and if you're unsure of ways to enjoy 
the journey, you know, reach out to us on places like the forum. You can connect with the wider community on places like our Facebook social hub. And you can see other people who are enjoying the journey and you might find ways to, yeah, connect with the process and connect with the journey and, you know, have a good time while we're doing this thing. Definitely. I do think celebrating the little wins is my tip for enjoying the journey. And mm-hmm. it's okay to put it out there and, and show people what you've done and people will in that group will be very, very supportive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Now, Nick, in uh, in week eight, so just next week, we have our week eight check-in. Okay. So that's on Friday, the 25th of March. So you'll be able to check in just like you did in the week four check-in. You will just now be prompted into week eight and we'll be asking for a progress photo of yourself. So no, um, you know, newspaper or completion document or anything like that required, just a progress photo for yourself similar advice to what we suggested in week four is to take a photo that's similar to your week four and your starting photo so you can get a nice comparison from the the start week four and week eight so once you complete your check-in you'll have access to the weeks nine to twelve um training templates um and then you have up until the end of the challenge to do your week eight check-in okay so that's uh coming up just next weekend Mm. so yeah get get your cameras ready yeah click click (laughs) Now, Nick, uh, I think it's time that we speak a little bit more about this app that's coming in 2022. We've spoken a little bit about it on the podcast um, over over the past couple of months. Uh, But yes, you know, we are planning to release the new and updated and fully functional um, challenge app. Okay, so it's going to be an app and the entire challenge process is going to be on the app. So, uh, you know, our website's going to change very drastically. Um, our program is going to change a lot. So, you know, those spreadsheets are, are going away. It's all going to be on an app. It's going to be really cool. Um, all the nutrition is going to be on an app. All the training is going to be on the app. Um, and all your check-ins are going to be on the app. The forum is going to be on the app. Everything's going to be on the app. It's going to be really cool, really excited. Um, and part of that, Nick, uh, we can announce is that we are going to rebrand slightly. So uh, instead of the Max and the Maxine Challenge, there's going to be a, a merging of the two brands and we are going to call it the, the, M, the M challenge, Nick, the M challenge. So combining both Max and Maxine to the M challenge. Um, that's going to be all on an app and that's coming in 2022. And we hope to release it M. by, yes, the M. And you can make a little M sign. Yeah, M with your hands. There you go. That will be our little, our little cult. That's right. Nick. There you go. Uh, but look, we will pl- be planning to release that towards the uh, middle of this year. So hopefully by our uh, next challenge, hopefully by the May challenge, we're able to release that fully functional for you to utilize. Um, but if uh, anybody has worked in project management or app development, uh, you probably understand that it takes a little bit of time to kind of get all the moving pieces together. So uh, we hope to release it by mid-year, um, but we, we hope the timelines all, all match up. But that's exciting for us working on the app. Um, and then part of that is a little bit of understanding that with new products like an application, of course, there is in, in inherently a chance of bugs to be present. Um, so there might be parts of the app that may not be working as perfectly as we hope they are. Um, but we hope that you are patient with us as we kind of roll out this new application in 2022. Very exciting. This will show us how many people listen to the podcast because um, we'll see if anyone comes up with Ooh, the M challenge. The M and challenge. Yes. Let's see. So um, if you have listened, do let us know that you're excited or let us know your feedback. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's a pretty simple name. M challenge. Uh, you know, it was, it was come up with a, with a team of us and we thought Max, Maxine, first start with M. Let's put it together, the M challenge. Um, crazy. It was a crazy yeah. day. It was a crazy day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, might, might have been something in our in our drinks that day, but uh, we won't talk about that. <laughs> no, it would have been um, melt. Melt, yes. Yes, melted our brains together and just, you know, <laughs> kidding. Um, but yes, so that's exciting in, in, in 2022. But again, we hope that we able to release it soon so that you can uh, enjoy the new features that we've been working on um, with that, that application all on your smartphone. Um, so uh, yeah, no, no, no need to go across different applications, different areas. It's all going to be on one place, our new M Challenge app. Yay, that's so exciting. Now, Nick, I must comment on some of your lifts. I've been watching you on Instagram and yeah. they're just going through the roof. Uh, yes. What the hell is happening? How, what are you doing to get so strong? Well, I mean, it's, it's a culmination of a few things. So it's sort of, it's many, many years of training. So it might all be coming together. It's, it's fairly um, good programming as well and me adhering to that. 
So that's also another thing. And then just recently, I've actually had a deload. So I've come back um, quite strong and I've trusted in that process of the deload. Um, somebody such as myself who, who loves being active, I mean, sometimes I don't take all the best advice. I don't listen to Coach Steve all the time and <laughs> and, and <laughs> take a deload at, at the percentage that I should. And, and I certainly, when I do, I certainly ne don't necessarily have faith that it's going to um, make me lift well straight away after. I always think that it takes me a good week um, or two to get better. But then if you combine it with a nice lot of food as well and actually listen <laughs> to everybody that's telling you what you should be doing, you can come back quite strong. So yeah. um, that's what's happened to me. So recommend, 10 out of 10 recommend the deload. Yeah, no, very <laughs> cool. And uh, you know, in, in sports science, we call that the super compensation effect. So uh, for all of my um, sports nerds out there, you can just Google super compensation if you haven't heard of that concept yet. Um, but, you know, there, on a graph, there is that element of like fatigue that accumulates over time. And that time could be, you know, weeks or months or years. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we do go through that kind of deload or even just like active recovery where, heck, you might even take a whole week off of training, which, which I'm actually doing right now, you might find it's a, a super compensation, a, an increase in performance um, for like a short period of time. And there are like strategies, especially in periodization, where you kind of utilize the deload and then ride that super compensation into your next meso cycle. So it's getting a little bit, a little bit funky and fancy. Um, but if you're following the challenge and you're taking it through those kind of like periodization waves, you might actually be doing this normally within your own training. But of course, it depends on how much you deload, you rest, recover, because uh, the whole point of training is not just to beat ourselves up. It's about recovering like a boss, right, Nick? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's part of the entire process. And I think that if you actually put yourself through it, you do realize how valuable it is. Like I can preach it and things, but then I, I, I might preach it, but I might also be doing, you know, 12,000 steps and other things like that. So if you, if you do take a real step back, um, eat some nice food, have some rest and come back, um, it's amazing what your body will do. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and two points on, on that, Nick, is one, it depends on what your minimum standard of activity is. Like, you know, if you're still doing 10,000 steps, perfect. You know, take some time off, happy days. But if your time off is to literally, uh, you know, sit on the couch and not move your body, okay, you might be facing some, some challenges with that approach to, to a deload. And then number two point is that how many times have you heard of, challenges or other people who would say something like oh i missed a few training sessions and maybe ate a little bit more food on this particular day that's it it's all over mm. right whereas yourself nick oh i'm taking a few days off of training and i'm eating a little bit more food it's all happening right it's just mm. that mindset shift of you're doing the exact same thing as what someone who might have quote fallen off the wagon end quote is doing but in a strategic way to get an improvement in their performance. So if you're listening to this and you are finding that you're falling off the wagon or whatever that, that means, where maybe you are eating a little bit more food and taking a little bit, uh, lowering your intensity in training, like that could be a really powerful strategy that people utilize to improve import performance. So you might find that when you go back to the gym, you feel better. You are like of higher energy levels and you're able to perform harder. So uh, you can yeah. strategically use these, 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 these strategies so that you can get the most out of your fitness endeavors right true and also i always use pictures for progress and i'm probably quite a bit leaner as well so um just the pictures reflect that so that is also um a really good sign yeah what <laughs> I, I should i've got to stop reading coach steve's articles on deloading <laughs> <laughs> yeah deloading dealing but yeah, look, so like I'm in a bit of a, a deload at the moment, right? Because um, I've got my competition coming up this Sunday, right? Or meet. So, so I'm, I'm doing my, my powerlifting meet this Sunday. And for me, I've had my last training session just a couple of days ago. And I'm going to go through active um, recovery or, or a deload over this next week. So I'm not actually touching barbells this week. Okay, pretty wild. Yeah. So I'm not wow. going to be lifting any, any weights. Um, I have a, a reformer bed at home. So I'm going to be doing some uh, like gentle Pilates exercises, a little yep. bit of mobility work, some light stretching, keeping my steps up, um, but allowing my body some, some quality time to recover. That's the main goal, just to recover. Like a lot of my joints are really beat up. Um, if you've been following me on Instagram, you know, I've got a little bit of like lower back pain and things happening in me. Um, but, you know, taking some time just to allow my joints to recover, allow my muscles to recover. So then come 
um, meet day on, on Sunday or competition day, um, everything is, is back close to, to peak levels, or if not at super compensation effect, so that um, I can um, put in my best effort on, on that, that meet. So uh, yeah, it's exciting times, but I, I kind of have itchy feet, you know, I kind of like need to lift up something. So that's going to be a little bit of discipline on my end to allow my body to rest and recover um, and just focus on, you know, my, my step count over this next week. You can lift baby George. Lift baby George. Yes. He, he would be, how many kilos is he now? Oh, he's well over 10 kilos now. He is one big boy. There you he's, go. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh like yeah. Daddy. We, we um, just started him on, on solids, Nick. And oh, the other yeah. night, the other night he had a little bit of bolognese. Ooh. Oh. So he's uh getting some, some like beef you. in him. Yeah. 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 So uh, he's going to, going to be McMassive. Mm. Oh my gosh. Now, um, when you do your meat, uh, because you won't have touched the barbell, you'll have to have a bit of a warm up strategy for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, just for all of us who are fascinated, just talk us through what you're going to do on the day. Just a few things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, all right. So, point one would be that I need to make my uh, competition weight class. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm cruising at about uh, just over 104 kilos in the moment and I need to be under 105 to make the 105 kilo weight class okay. so my strategy will depend on how my weight fluctuates leading up to that uh, particular day okay so um, it's, it's quite linear so if I'm clearly under the 105 happy days no no dramas um, you know my uh, nutrition will be lots of hydration that will be the big part of it trying to get as much uh, water into my body as I can and loading up on um, carbohydrate, right? Uh, mainly as I lead up to the competition, um, looking at more easy to digest carbohydrates. So I'm actually looking at what most people would classify as junk food, but you know things like candy, sweets, um, like chips and stuff is probably the things that I'm looking for on the actual day, easy to digest um, compared to uh, things like fruit, right? Mainly because of the fiber content between the two, okay? Mm -hmm. um, especially leading up to the, like an hour before, I'll be looking at more sodium and salt. Um, so, you know, those things like packets of chips um, might be a good option for me because they're high in carbohydrate, really easy to digest carbohydrate because they're super processed um, and really high in sodium as well. So that will help with performance outputs. Okay. Hmm. Um, and then mixed in with the height, with the like lots of water, they'll increase, increase my hydration levels as well. Okay. Um, then if I'm not meeting that weight class so if i'm cruising just over 105 for whatever reason um, i'll be looking at things like a water cut okay so i'll be trying to decrease water leading up to the event do my weigh in and then when the weigh in is met and if i'm underneath that weight class happy days then i'll go through a similar cycle but uh, more fast tracks where i'm having lots of water lots of salt to hydrate my tissues okay when it comes to actually preparing right warming up it's no different to any warm-up you would complete um but a little bit more um focused on the actual movement pattern okay so i wouldn't do any long elaborate warm-ups like you know i'm not walking on a treadmill or anything like that i'll go straight to a barbell empty bar and practicing the movement pattern okay because mm -hmm. it's all about patterning the movement because i i have strength in that one range of motion in that like squat pattern but if i do something different to a squat or a different to a, like a low bar squat which i've been practicing like a, fr a front squat i don't have as much strength okay so i go straight to that low bar practicing that low bar happening and then slowly ramp up my um, warm-up so that I get closer to the working weights that I use um, and incrementing at, at you know maybe like a 10% increment you know only like one or two repetitions at a time okay mm -hmm. so I'm aiming for like a 220 squat so that will be my third attempt uh, my second attempt 210 first attempt 200 so um, I'm going to be warming up to maybe like that 170, maybe 190 is my final warm up, And mm -hmm. then 200 um, is my first attempt at the squat. And then the once I've completed the squat, I move on to the bench press. So I start uh, potentiating or patterning the, the bench press and then similar with the deadlift. Uh, but I'm a little bit anxious about the deadlift because, you know, it's so fatiguing once you get through the squat and the bench press. Once I get to the deadlift, um, you know, I probably have would need a, a lesser of a warm up because my body is probably quite fatigued at that stage. Yeah. So, um, you know, that would be fewer warm up um, sets of fewer warm up reps. Um, basically, you know, getting ready just to 
literally grip and rip, you know, just grab yeah. hold and, and, and pull that. I was thing. thinking that. I was yeah. going to say exactly those words. Yeah, you want to be super smart with that one, don't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, a little bit of it is grounded in like my strategic uh, nutrition strategy approach to it, mainly focused around carbs, water, and salt. Um, mm-hmm. And then a little bit focused around um, patterning the, the, the movement itself. Um, but, you know, uh, over this week, you know, I will still be working on, you know, joint mobility and such so like i'm not i'm not stressed about my body not ready for those movement patterns um a week off isn't isn't too long right um you know you still remember those those movements um and and it'll just be getting ready uh, mentally for it for the event because uh, you, you've competed nick it's all it's all a mental a mental game right you've got to, got to be in the zone ready to ready to perform definitely and yeah just um don't make any silly mistakes like um you know within the the their rules like dropping yeah. dropping the bar or something like that yeah You're not supposed to put it yeah. down nicely but you do that sort of stuff yeah I just have to be mama at the moment and tell yeah. you because yeah. don't get all your good lifts and then um like not not actually get them you know yeah what's going to catch me out is the the bench press because they they you know tell you to uh, start where you lower the bar down to your chest yeah and then once the bar comes to a stop at your chest they say press and you press yeah. the bar and once yeah. your arms are straight they tell you to rack or put the bar away so um often people get uh uh caught out once they press the weight that they mm. just rack straight away because that's what they practice they've practiced with but they haven't waited for the judge to say rack and then they get uh red lighted because they yes. racked it too early right exactly so yeah you're gonna have to just do you remember those little things? Yeah. And it's a strange one, right? Because you think like, oh, you've, you've made the lift, just put the weight away, but then you get red lighted, even though you've made the lift, but you just didn't rack it correctly. Yes. That's yeah. That's a, a problem. We don't want that problem for you. No, no. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. And um, yeah, hopefully I get the, the national qualification, um, which I'm aiming for 585 kilos total um but we'll, we'll see you know like no pressure on myself and uh i think it's all a learning experience because even if you uh you know fail something like this it's always you, you take something away from it right and um that's the whole point of it yeah 100 percent. and you can work out from there um what strategies worked what didn't work and then you can just enter another one that's right that's right so, yeah, we wish you all the best and we can't wait to hear about it next month next week next week yeah you'll probably get a debrief in that uh it's gonna be good be oh exciting. i'll be asking I'll be asking for all. Uh, in fact, my my coach's corner will be asking you questions about your comp. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, Nick. Let's move on to our non-scale victories for the week. So we're celebrating those uh, victories that aren't really related to the scales. So, Nick, who did you find this week? All right, let's take it away. So we've got Rabina Hewson. So Rabina says. Week six, and I'm feeling fantastic. Week one, I couldn't do these shorts up, so there was a visual of shorts. Now they fit. NSV, where do I start with my NSVs? I've had so many during the six weeks. Yesterday, I forgot my trainers. I walk in my lunch break at work. This could have been an excuse to not walk. The old me would have used that for sure, but not now. I walked in my work shoes, maybe not as fast or as far, but hey, I still got up and moved huge win for me for my mindset it's changed so much i just couldn't possibly sit for my hour lunch break how good is that that's awesome yeah so good. just um creating new habits and um now she's associating her lunch break with walking and it doesn't feel right to not walk so i hope the heels weren't too high um but that's good for your calves anyway so um <laughs> good on you rabina that's really good I, I hope other people are inspired by that and i hope that if you're listening uh you know on the train or something you think well i will walk in my lunch break just like rabina be like rabina be like rabina love it okay so the next one is caroline gillies so she says i had an nsv today that i wanted to share with the group during prep my deadlift one max one rep max weight was 90 kilos and i told myself i'd crack 100 by the end of the challenge i even put it on the vision board we have to do at work Well, I'm pleased to say that today my one rep max was 105. When I first started in the gym in 2015, there was a trainer there who spoke about lifting 100 kilos and I was in such awe of her. If only I had believed in myself sooner. That's the best. I love it. Love it. Love it hitting the the triple digits. So good, Caroline. Yeah, it's it's always, it's that goal that you, you see other people doing stuff and you think I could do it. And there's no reason why you can't, you can, you just need to keep practicing. And um, the vision board is a great idea as well, because that's something that makes things come true. So well done. Next one I've got is Alicia Morse. So back at 
at it this week after 10 days of being sick and looking after four sick children. Stayed on track with nutrition but wasn't able to work out. So very sore legs, so very sore legs today after Monday and Tuesday. Loving getting back into my walks and listening to podcasts for inspiration. So hopefully, Alicia, you listen to this podcast because you had an NSV. You came back and you stayed on track with your nutrition. Well done, especially at this time because um, everybody's experiencing all sorts of stuff going on. And um, if you can just see it as a little blip and then stay on that path, then um, that's exactly what we'd love you to take away from this challenge, really. Yeah, well so done. good. So good, Alicia. Mm. I've got a couple here. The first one is Melanie Cook. Hello, Melanie. And Melanie writes, struggling mentally this week, Queensland floods have made it tough to get my steps up. Have been doing laps in my hallway to get 10,000 steps in. Wow, that's awesome. Listen to the podcast this morning, which has renewed my motivation. Thanks, Coach Nick and Coach Steve for this great resource. So Melanie, hopefully you're listening to this podcast today. And uh, yeah, my, my, I, my sympathies go out to everybody in New South Wales and in Queensland who have been affected by the floods. Uh, and I, I hope that your family's safe and you're safe. Um, and, you know, like Melanie, she's doing steps in her, uh, her whole way to get her 10,000 steps in. So she's making it work, getting it done. So congratulations, Melanie. Mm, congratulations. Oh, and I'm, I'm feeling for everybody. And um, yeah, I hope that you hear this and it just brightens your day a little bit. A little bit. Mm. Next one here goes to Howard Goodies. And Howard writes, definitely getting fitter and stronger. Rowing warm up at the start of the challenge was two minutes 30 for 500 meters. Now it's getting close to two minutes. Awesome, Howard. You're shaving off 30 seconds off your 500 meter row. I think that's a that's a, an amazing achievement. And gosh, Nick, I think the, the rower for me is like my kryptonite. I suck at rowing. <laughs> and if you put me on an ergo, that's probably one, one very quick way to break me, both uh, like cardiovascularly, physically, I just suck at it. So uh, Howard, good job showing us how it's done. Oh, it's a killer. It's a killer. I think you, you would um, also dislike the assault bikes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that would break me too. Yep. <laughs> especially now, especially now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of Coach Steve to move. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot more of me to move, yes. Um, all right. <clears throat> the next one here, final one, goes out to Julie Kahneman. Julie Carmen and hers was a double uh, throwback Thursday and NSV. And she's right. I'm not throwing back too far. Just rewinding to the start of this challenge with this throwback lives, a hashtag NSV, which is not hitting the snooze button. I've done a couple of challenges now. And I think this is my biggest NSV. I've made a deal with myself not to hit snooze because of this. I'm getting the, getting to the gym earlier, getting more reps in, more steps in, and more time for ab work, all of them in NSV in itself. I'm super happy with my compounding NSV when I throw back to five weeks ago. I think that's awesome. You know, it's just it's such a, a small time, you know, that like five weeks, just a month, just over a month, and seeing that huge change. And it's a simple change in our habits, our routines of not hitting that snooze button. And that's translated over to you know, more steps, getting earlier in the gym, getting more reps in, you know, getting more things done. So that's a, that's a huge milestone in any transformation. So big congratulations to Julie. Congratulations, Julie. That's so good to hear. I love that. And um, yeah, not hitting the snooze button is such a big deal. It really is. So well done. That's awesome. Yes. So big congratulations to all of our NSV participants this week. If you're experiencing NSV, let us know. You can post about it on places like your journal, on the forum, um, on your Instagram or on Facebook in our uh, social hub, our Facebook social hub. Um, use the hashtag, hashtag NSV or tag us on Instagram. Make sure we see it and you could be featured in our podcast. Mm. Nick, let's move on to our coach's corner where we offer our tip for the week. So Nick, take us away. What advice do you have for us? All right. So once again, um, I'm giving you a bit of a coach Nick motivation versus discipline type chat. So there was a question on the Facebook group uh, that I will steal just because it kind of sums up everything that I want to chat about. It, the question is, challenge, slump or heat, suggestions to beat either. The last two weeks where I have been living is 38 degrees and a thousand percent humidity it's sucking the life out of me and i've found it very very difficult to stay motivated so um firstly 
I think it's really important when I read that not to make decisions for your entire challenge or life based on an emotional viewpoint like it you know it's sucking the life out of me that kind of language it's very emotional tired you never make the best decisions when you're in that sort of state of mind so I would like to give everyone a tip if you're having a crappy day that's probably the least best day to make a, an entire decision about the challenge so if like we might see this week on the Facebook group people saying I'm, I'm out I'm checking out sometimes we see that around about this time and take a deep breath about that um, don't do it from an emotional point of view so if you've sat down and you've weighed it all up and you've decided that that's what you really want to do and you're ready to commit to not going on then that's fine but if it's from an emotional point of view just wait a second on it and have a think about the pros and cons so weigh that up now um heat is going to happen um you know feeling not motivated is going to happen um that's where discipline has to kick in so I know, Steve, you're the same as me. Like, we love training. We love it. Like, we have this job because we we love training. Like, we we train, we you know, we train when we can, all that sort of thing. Um, it's sort of part of what we do. But I'm not always super motivated to go and train. Um, I don't remember the last time I turned up and thought, I can't wait to do this today. It usually happens when you're in the session. I don't know about you, but once you once you're kind of in the session, you go, "Oh, this is okay. I can keep going." But um, there's so many factors in life that make you um, not feel motivated. So I just want to say that that is common across everybody. So if you're new to fitness and you think, "Oh no, I I don't feel motivated. This isn't right." I'm seeing so many pictures of everybody living their best lives on the group. You know, at the gym flexing. That's a moment in time. I bet you that person, if you were going to rewind it, probably was in their car in the gym car park going, oh, I better take an extra scoop of pre-workout today because I'm not feeling it. I don't want to go in there. Oh, I just don't feel like it. I can't believe I have to do that today. So that's very common as well. So um, there are different types of motivation. uh, And one is um, an intrinsic motivation and one is an extrinsic motivation. So if you're motivated to do something because somebody else tells you to do it say like um your boss at work tells you to do something not us because we we love doing that but um you know just say that your, your boss says you need to do this but it's not really what you really want to do then that's something that also can kind of um make your motivation wane so if it's for example if you are in the challenge and you are doing something because you are um extrinsically motivated people are saying to you you should be lifting weights and you really love running then something's got to give. You're not going to be able to continue to do that if it's not your goal. So sit down and visit what actually speaks to you because there's, as we've said before many times, there's plenty of things within the fitness world that you can do. Just because we love lifting weights and we say do that and, um, you know, we talk about uh, resistance training and you and I have all our goals around that, that can be a side hustle to what you really love to do, which is running or triathlon. I had a discussion on the Facebook group with somebody who said to me, I can't believe you, you're not doing triathlon anymore. And it, it, the thing is, it, it really comes down to what motivates you. So I was getting out of bed doing triathlons and going, oh, I don't really want to do it. I was like, oh, maybe I could get in that boat and be driven back to the shore. <laughs> so um, that isn't good. So that happens to all of us. So I want you to think about just, Um, what actually motivates you from the inside like what does your heart really want to do unless it's sitting on the couch and eating chips every day because that isn't probably very good so towards your best goals just write a little bit of a list about what really motivates you inside so coach Steve what is your intrinsic motivation my intrinsic motivation well Mm. uh, I think for me the course has changed over time um, right now, I use training as um, a, a a mental modulator, right? So, or an emotional modulator. Like, if I don't train, like I feel stressed, I feel overwhelmed, I feel anxious. I, I get all these feelings, you know, these normal human feelings. Um, and I use training as a as a, a way to kind of organize my day, give me structure, right? Um, I like a lot of structure. And if I, the, the gym is a perfect example of of structure. You know, there's sets, reps, there's a routine, there's a there's a 
to have, there's a system in place. Um, and sometimes in life, you don't have that full control over the whole system. So, you know, going and training gives me that grounding point so that I can keep on doing what I like doing. So yeah, I think probably the biggest one is that that mental outlet for me, um, that's probably number one. And then number two, um, I do want to maintain a certain um, appearance, a certain level of fitness, um, not just for me, but for uh, like the people that are important to me, such as my partner and now my, my, my boy. Um, so, you know, I want to um, look and perform a certain way so that I can, you know, play with my my son or, you know, go for a walk or do the gardening or, you know, look a certain way. Um, so yeah, there are some like uh, mental outlets for me and then, you know, doing it for somebody else, uh, which is an interesting one. I think uh, is, a, is a big driver, especially for those of us who have uh, like dependents, you know, that can be a big motivating factor. Like I want to train so that I can still play with my son, right? Um, I want to train so that I can be the best version of myself so that I can be there for him. Um, that's important for me. And that's what kind of gets me into the gym. I think that's really good. I think that's something else that you can do. And that's a really good point. Something that you can do is remove yourself from the equation, remove your own emotion from the equation and think about everybody else who might benefit from what you're doing as well. If you're just in a slump and you're like, I just can't keep doing this, but then you can go back to thinking, I want to be healthy for my family. And that one will probably get you right into the gym pretty quickly. And um, just one other thing I want to touch on before we move on is uh, even though we've just had a pretty good discussion about it. The other thing that I think is really important is sometimes to stop overthinking it. You know, you might be feeling tired. You might be a little bit unwell. You know, things might be happening. It might be hot. Um, it might not be the best day to do a massive training session. So just focus on that particular day, getting yourself moving a little bit, keeping up your hydration and sticking to your nutrition. Nothing bad's going to happen. We've spoken about that. Um, at nauseum today like it's our favorite topic today just about having a bit of a rest um, backing off don't overthink it um, don't make any huge judgment calls on yourself if you need a rest occasionally and um, just remember to keep moving forward that's right it's about mm. all those all those little steps to get you closer definitely yeah no so good so good mm. nick i want to talk a little bit about injuries okay and how do injuries actually happen? Okay, so uh, to really start with definitions, what is an injury? An injury is actual tissue damage in the body. Okay, mm -hmm. um, that's quite different to pain. So uh, pain can be present with or without an injury. And an example of that is, let's say, a, a bruise, right? We've all had a bruise and we've all kind of found a bruise that we didn't know we had. <laughs> so a bruise, what it is, is it's bleeding, right? It's bleeding so because of tissue damage. But a lot of times bruises aren't painful, you know, unless you start poking them. But a lot of times we don't even know how we got that bruise. Okay, so, uh, you know, the pain um, isn't, always uh, associated with an injury and then even the level of pain um, doesn't always equal the level of the injury and and an example of that is like a paper cut we've all had a paper cut and that could be such a small insignificant little thing on your hand but it's like the most painful experience of our life so mm. the the level of pain doesn't always equal or match the level of the injury and pain can be present with or without an injury, okay? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how injuries actually happen, okay? And it is a little bit of a, a, a simplified kind of math equation, okay? So we all have a certain uh, capacity of our body, right? Think of it like a, um, a weight limit, okay? And an example would be a little um, silly chair that I bought George, okay? So it's a, it's a, this like giraffe, right? It's like this giraffe and you could sit on it, right? And it has a weight limit of 100 kilos, okay? So me, I'm at 104 kilos, okay? So if I went on sit on went to sit on the the, the, the little giraffe, uh, the giraffe could kind of break, right? So we all have, we all independently have kind of like our capacity limit, our weight limit, right? And that capacity means all of the stresses that we put on our body stresses meaning the the weight that we lift the total amount of volume of activity that we do talking about our steps the housework lifting the kids lifting weights you know all these stresses but then all of the other stresses that we have in our life you know things like emotional stresses right we've got stresses in our family we've got financial stresses we've got workplace stresses all these stresses add to our total uh, kind of capacity right so we all have that tipping point now that tipping point isn't just like a straight fine line. 
it's a bit more of a range, okay? So similar to this giraffe, like I could go and sit down on the giraffe and I'm sure it will be okay. You know, I'm 104 kilos, the weight limit is 100 kilos. It would be okay if I kind of slowly sat down on the giraffe and just relaxed, right? But it'd be very different if I went and, you know, like jumped on the giraffe, right? Something out of like a WWE move. Like if I jumped on the giraffe, the giraffe is going to break, right? Because the force is no longer just 104 kilos of Coach Steve sitting on the giraffe. It's like, you know, we're using that momentum. It's a different force, a different um, vector onto it, and it would, you know, collapse, okay? And that's kind of similar in our body, right? Where there's a, a, a range, right? So depending on the individual day, you know, maybe our emotional state, you know, how much of that stressor actually like hit us, right? Um, that can change our overall capacity, all right? So um, what happens when an injury occurs is our, um, you know, volume, our total workload overreached our level of capacity, okay? And that could be, again, through a culmination of lots of things, right? Such as our yeah emotional state, our, our stress from work, you know, we've got our, our, our kids' lives, you know, putting an extra stress on us, we've maybe financially under a little bit of stress, and you're going to go and try to get the, the 100 kilo deadlift, right? So all these stresses can apply. Um, now, there's this concept of kind of like a, a acute stress versus chronic stress. So if you're constantly in a state of, you know, lots of things, let's say a hundred units of stresses in your life, that's your normal, right? You're, you've been doing it for a really long time. If you are going to then do 120 units of stress in your life, um, that's going to be over our capacity. Okay. So that's going to be a, a recipe for an injury to occur. Whereas the other way, if you are constantly doing hundred units of stress, in your life, but then you're now doing 80 units of stress, okay, you're in happy zone, right? And if you did want to increase your total units of stress, we want to slowly build up and increase that over time. So what am I talking about with these units of stress? Let's just correlate it over to something like kilos lifted, okay? If you have always been lifting, let's say 100 kilos on a deadlift, that's what you do week in, week out, happy days. And then out of nowhere, you see Coach Nick in a gym and you go, okay, Nick, let's do a deadlift party. Let's just try to max out. Let's try to lift as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And you normally load two plates on each side, 100 kilos. And now you see Coach Nick loading three plates on and you're like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do what Coach Nick does. You load up three plates. That is above your capacity. It's above your chronic capacity because you've always been lifting 100 kilos. You then go to 140 kilos that's a recipe for an injury to occur. Literal tissues in our body that are above its capacity uh, and it's going to fail and cause damage in our body, okay? Now, and it's not always the kilos that we lift. It can be the total um, volume that we lift as well. So if you always do two sets of deadlifts, but then now you want to do three sets of deadlifts, that's above what you normally do. So that can lead to tissue damage occurring and then similar with our rep ranges. So if you always do 10 reps at hundred kilos and now you want to do 20 reps, that's above our capacity. So how do injuries occur? We all have a range that is our uh, total capacity of load, right? Um, in terms of total stresses. And if we overreach that range, then an injury can occur. And the exact same thing happened to me just recently while I was preparing for this meet this weekend. So I increased the total amount of load that I was lifting. So the weight on the bar, um, and I was doing it more frequently. So instead of doing a variety of different exercises, let's say, you know, a bench press, instead of doing like the competition bench press, close grip, incline, maybe overhead press, I was only doing my competition bench. So I was normally doing, let's say three sets at a certain amount of weight. Now I was doing, you know, 12 sets a week, right? Tripling my total load um, of more, of higher load in general. Um, that ended up being causing a little bit of uh, shoulder pain, potentially a little bit of an injury happening in my shoulder. And then now a little bit of lower back um, pain and a little bit of an injury occurring there because I've lost my ability to kind of flex through my spine. So um, there's some things that I'm working on leading up to the meet, but all I'd say is that injuries are very normal. Injuries are things that um, are never really going to happen through training. Um, it's about how we kind of approach these injuries, right? Where we 
we can choose to just completely stop what we're doing um, or we can choose to work around those injuries, make the most of them as our body kind of naturally heals and regresses to the mean. So uh, injuries are normal, injuries are okay. And injuries are maybe a little bit of a, a lesson um, in our load prescription. And sometimes we just need to just dial it back a little bit, just like taking a deload or trying to manage the other stresses in our lives. That's excellent. Really good. And um, I hope everybody takes that on board because yeah, very, very valuable information there. Yeah. The main lesson, don't jump on that giraffe because it will break. Yeah. And also <laughs> I got to say, like, I wouldn't let anybody um, suddenly deadlift 140 near me if they've only ever done 100. Because now I feel like I have to do a Coach Nick disclaimer. <laughs> but, like I am a mad woman. But uh, yeah. if I saw someone doing that, I, I, I would probably tell them like, just let's go for 102.5 yeah yeah but you know you, you do it too but like we, we get carried away right oh, you might go and train with your buddies and you're like oh you definitely. have to do no. more reps or more sets or whatever you know there's a wellness on ifbb wellness pro danae who trains at um at my gym and she just squats 140 for reps you know just like perfectly she's got bigger quads than you Steve like well wow. she's she's this tall but yeah anyway I mean I look at that and I think wow you know mm. that's what I want to be yeah. and I, I just tell her rather than trying to do it I go I want to be like you <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. So good. yeah all right Nick let's go through some questions for the week so the first question here um taken from our forum but a little bit summarized it goes is it better to stay under your calorie counts but only have about half the protein suggested and carbs are pretty smack on or just go over the calories less than hundred calories over to get closer to the protein goal. Uh, so Nick, what advice would you have for this person? Stay under their calories or go over their calories to meet their protein? I would say first up, um, yeah, it's a good question. Look, it's good that you're thinking about it and everything. But yeah, in, in this situation, it's always about um, energy balance. So calories, calories come first. Um, macros are second. So if you, um, on our on our website under um, the nutrition information somewhere, there's actually a lovely um, description about the hierarchy of nutrition. But yeah, at the very bottom of this pyramid, at the very base, it's all about energy balance. So if you ever have any worries about um, that kind of a thing and, you, you you know, perhaps you've been out, maybe your, your meal has been a little bit carb heavy, fat heavy. Um, yeah, if you can stick to your calorie total, it'll all be fine. We we encourage, um, you know, we, we want you to have um, your protein and hit your protein target mostly just, just to prevent muscle loss when you're in a diet um, phase as well. But in, in one particular day, it's all about energy balance. So definitely calories first and then macros second. Oh, good. I like it. Mm. Simple answer. Yeah. Calories first, macros second, especially, mm. I mean, of course, uh, depending on your, your, your goal, right? If your goal was weight loss, yeah, we want to be matching your, your calories. If your goal was weight gain, okay, maybe your calorie target isn't as fixed and you could be splurging a little bit more um so of course there's more follow-up questions to be had but you know 99 percent of the time aim for calories first macro second yeah true absolutely true so yeah that's assuming that it's weight loss but I i'm assuming from the question because it's so um so worried about going over that i'd say she's trying to yeah yeah, lose weight. yeah. No, i agree next question here again from the forum a little bit summarized it goes I got a whoop band. They're pretty cool, the whoop bands. I got a whoop band last week. And now that it's calibrated, it's telling me I should increase my strain, which is measured as the time your heart rate spends at an elevated level. Should I increase my load um, or step up to the intermediate training program to increase my strain? Okay, let's talk about it. So um, what causes our heart rate to be elevated it's training at a higher intensity okay so higher intensity could mean more load on the bar which is part of the question here it can also mean um you know walking at a faster pace um, or doing things quicker so wherever we're putting in more effort higher intensity okay um what won't increase our heart rate is just doing um, more total volume of activity. So instead of doing, let's say, 10 sets of exercise, 
you increasing it to 20 sets of exercise in a certain workout isn't going to guarantee that our heart rate is going to increase. Okay. That's like, you know, let's say doing a little bit of housework and instead of doing housework, um, you know, just in your kitchen, you now do in your kitchen and your living room, you're just doing more work. That doesn't always mean, um, a higher heart rate because you could just be you know, taking your time to do that. Okay, so um, what would increase the strain on the whoop band? It would be increasing the intensity and you can do that by increasing the total load. So total weight on the bar. Um, you could also increase your heart rate by um, you know, taking more sets closer to failure. So if you're you know, training at what we call like a five RPE or a five, RIR, so rate of perceived exertion or reps in reserve. So if you're really far away from failure, you know, you're not training at a really high intensity. So of course your heart rate isn't going to increase. Now, the only comment I would make about increasing heart rate, um, heart rate isn't always uh, closely linked to, you know, body composition changes, right? We don't need to, you know, really elevate our heart rate for like fat loss to occur. Fat loss happens when we consume, um, fewer calories than we require. So it's nothing really linked to our, to our heart rate. Sure, you can go on and rationalize saying that at certain heart rate zones, we are metabolizing or oxidating um, fat more than glucose in our, in our body, but that doesn't always change the total amount of fat in our, our body, okay? Um, so to reach the whoop goal would be different to reaching some of the goals that you might have in the challenge. Because if you wanted to reach that whoop goal to increase your strain, you might as well just walk on like a treadmill at a, a medium to, to, to high pace. Um, that's going to elevate your heart rate. And you could do that for, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. Great. You've got your elevated heart rate. Whereas if you're training, lifting weights, that's more of like interval training where your heart rate will increase then decrease, increase then decrease. So your total time spent in your strain would be lower than if you just did some steady state cardio. So uh, the, the crux of the question um, would be kind of back to that. It depends on the goal. If your goal is more challenge related, increasing body composition, um, we might not need to worry about your whoop strain. Or if your goal was really grounded in increasing your, your whoop goal, um, you, you may not even want to look at the training program and focus on just some steady state cardio. Yeah. And also um, sometimes when you do do that elevated heart rate stuff, <laughs> the, the intense stuff, it just takes your body a bit longer to recover as well. So you can get quite fatigued. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, you know, your sleep can suffer a little bit. And, and the thing that I always talk about, you start to get a little bit hungrier, especially mm -hmm. when you start to do that first up. And um, those those um, devices can be pretty demanding the, the heart rates that they kind of what they measure as an elevated heart rate um, sometimes you could it, it might not be accurate you might be already up there and it, it hasn't measured it and it, there's a delay I love it but it's just those other little things to think of that sometimes um, you don't think of because you just trust that device mm -hmm. yeah mm. yeah I do like smart devices I think they're really cool um, the technology is really awesome um, I would like to see them become even more awesome. I don't know what's above awesome, but even yeah. more awesome than what they are. Yeah, I love mine too. I'm obsessed with it. I, I will even make silly comments about mine such as, oh, I've, I've um, done this less today than other days and, and I get sucked in by it all. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing is, yeah, if you use the same device all the time, at least you've got something that you can measure against because it's your device and it's the same device. So you will know what's going on with it but yep. um yeah it has its limitations and I, I think you could have an entire challenge just based on whoop goals yeah no absolutely yeah. all right nick next question here a similar question that's been taken from our forum and mm -hmm. summarized this is quite a long one yeah and uh, nick you can answer this one okay, okay so it goes i want to build some size and strength and lean up a little I do lots of physical activity at work and ride about 80 kilometers per week to prepare for a fundraising event. Mm -hmm. I've lost three kilos from the start of the challenge to week three and had limited energy and was very moody. I swapped my calories from fat loss to maintenance to maintain my weight as I didn't want to drop too much. I am now at the end of week five and I've dropped weight again and now at 71 and a half kilos. I've lost some body fat around my stomach and love handles, but fear I'm leaning up too much and losing muscle. 
I don't want to lose any more weight and want to build some muscle. Would you recommend that I move to the muscle gain nutrition plan to try to uh, limit my and try to limit my training at work to try to regain some weight and strength and size? Wow. Would you, uh, any advice would be appreciated. Nick, what advice would you give to this person? Well, um, respect for your cycling goals. Um, uh, yeah, I've trained lots of cyclists and, um, you know, you guys have to, you have to eat when you're doing your endurance training because, um, yeah, it's quite stressful on the body and quite intense. And I look, I love all your goals, but, um, I've yet to see sort of an endurance cyclist that is, is massively muscular because um, those two goals are actually opposing. And you know what? You don't want to be too muscular and heavy when you're riding long distance because that's a lot of weight to carry. You know, I don't know if anyone's ever seen Robert Forsterman, but Steve, have you seen him? He's a, he's a um, the, like a really heavy cyclist who does huge squats and things, and he's a power cyclist. And he is massive, but the thing is he does short, sharp, powerful bursts of cycling. And, um, yeah, he's crazy. But when you are doing the endurance stuff, your body is going to adapt to whatever it is that you want to do. So it sounds like your goal, it sounds like this person's goal is to do that. So the thing is, of course, you're going to be losing weight, um, and yeah, you, you may not necessarily lean up a little because we don't, we don't know what sort of weight you're going to be losing because if you, if you're not building muscle, it, it could be, it could be a little bit of muscle as well. Um, yeah, I would say concentrate on the one goal and, um, fuel yourself adequately for that goal. And, um, yeah, then go into a muscle building phase because I'm just saying now there's there's just no way that you can do the endurance training and build a whole bunch of muscle as well. So I would probably be doing your cycling. I mean, 80Ks, look, to be honest, you can fit that in to um, a, a nice weight training regime, but I wouldn't be doing a muscle gaining phase at the moment while you're doing that. So you can certainly do a maintenance phase. You can certainly, um, you know, uh, do your lifting in the gym, um, eat. I would even eat in a surplus. I don't think that that's going to matter. I think that that will um, be nice, but there's just no way that you can probably make significant muscle gains at this point in time. So I'd be concentrating on getting that fundraiser done. And then um, I would be then moving into a phase where you stay a bit, stay a bit grounded, stay still. And um, it's really hard to tell people who who do these events to stay still but stay still and um get yourself into the gym and eat in that surplus and stop um stop cycling your gains away <laughs> i'm allowed to say that because i did that for years so like i'm really allowed to say that. and there's nothing against that either like it's it's great and it's a great goal but you can't build because i know that because only recently because i've stopped doing all the spin and that's when i've started to to gain yeah. It's a revelation. <laughs> yeah, I think the the biggest uh, point of the, this this question here is, you know, you, you've got to eat more, right? Um, if you wanted to build muscle, it probably wasn't wise to go on a fat loss strategy, which would put you in an energy deficit. So, of course, you can't add more mass if you're eating less energy, right? Um, and, you know, moving to the maintenance was a good step, I would say, to further increase your energy intake, especially if your goal is to build muscle. Like even if you just like look away from all the other activity that you're doing, you know, just ignore the the cycling, ignore the work you're doing at, at work and all the other things that you're choosing to do. When it simply comes to like building more mass on your body, you need a surplus of supplies, right? It's just like building a house. If you want to build a house, you need, you know, timber and bricks and cement and all the things to build the house. Um, so for yourself, I would say to just, eat more food. And especially if you're being so active, like, you know, you might even then need to eat more than what a program is suggesting for muscle gain, because, you know, you're, you're so unique um, and you, you need to find the right calorie prescription for you. Like if I was to say have 3000 calories, that might be enough. There might not, might not be enough given your physical activity level. You might be looking at three and a half, 4,000, 5,000 calories. Like it might be a problem where you just can't get enough food in to stop that weight going down, especially given how much activity you do. And then you might find what's well, really cool thing that happens is by eating more food, 
you get more efficient at your cycling. Sure, it's a long distance, but you know, you may be instead of getting to kilometer number 70 and being, you know, death on wheels, <laughs> you might find that kilometer 70, you're like, hey, this isn't that bad. I can keep going, you know. Um, so eat, eat more, eat more, eat more is probably the the advice that I would give to this person. And the other thing is also, we may as well touch on it. it when people want to lose fat but um gain muscle, it, it's sort of it's that thing where I think you see the pictures and you think that person's obviously lost fat, but um, you think that they've gained muscle. But what happens is when you lose body fat, your muscles become visible. So that might be what you're after rather than necessarily gaining muscle. You want to see what's under there. So that's just a point for everybody to think of. Is, is that what you want? Because yeah. you might want to see what's under there and then you want, might want to build from there just because it's confusing for people i think sometimes they go did they did they build muscle it's like no they they just revealed what they had and of, often the people that are quite successful are the ones that have been training for some time and have some muscle to reveal yeah yeah no, mm. i agree mm. last question here nick it goes uh again a question from the forum super summarized it says i've seen old bodybuilders lifting weights and they use momentum to go heavier is it better to go lighter and focus on form or go heavier and have a greater stimulus on your muscles? Okay. Interesting. I like this question. Okay. Mm. Let's break it down. Form. What is form? Um, I don't really like the word form. I don't know why. I, I think I like the word technique over form. Um, when we're talking about technique, you know, we're under like, you know, three kind of headings. Okay. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, what is the best technique for uh, injury prevention? What is the best technique for muscle building and what's the best technique for performance or for strength, right? And, and, and firstly, you know, to answer the question about technique um, for injury, um, you know, the best technique for, for injury is, uh, well, that technique doesn't really, really matter. Okay. So it's all about load, similar to my uh, explanation earlier about um, capacity. So regardless of what technique you use, if you use the correct load for that technique, injuries are fine, no dramas. Um, it's when we move out of our normal position into something different. Like for me, I could squat low bar, you know, easily over 200 kilos, happy days. But then if you put me in a different squat position, or I don't know, you change my technique in something that I didn't have strength in, then my body's not ready for that load injury occurs. So that's part one. Part two, when it comes to building muscle, uh, the best technique is one that stimulates the target muscle. Okay. So it's not about stimulating as much muscle as possible. It's about the target muscle that we're aiming for. Okay. So we want a technique that targets that muscle. And, you know, that can be very unique to each person. So if you put Nick and I into a machine chest press, um, we may feel different um, contractions in our pec muscles because we've got different body shapes, right? So um, it comes down to a very individual. And then we start looking at, um, you know, different aspects of, you know, stimulus to fatigue and um, raw stimulus magnitude and stuff like that, about the, the type of technique that works well for muscle building. Now for strength, for performance, it's all about levers, okay? It's all about internal levers and leverages and external levers and leverages, okay? So if you're doing a deadlift, again, very unique to the individual. If you had Nick and I doing a deadlift, that would have different techniques and both techniques could be optimal for our shape. Um, but there will be some principles, you know, such as keeping the weight close to our center of gravity to create force. Okay. So to answer the question here, is it better to go lighter and focus on form or go heavier and have a greater stimulus on muscle? Well, we need to have a technique that um, allows us to hit the target muscle. Okay. Then we want to apply as much load as we can so that we still maintain that technique and stimulate that muscle. So it's a little bit of, of half, half. The problem lies in using things like momentum to go heavier because then what can happen is we, if you utilize that momentum, the technique isn't repeatable. It isn't consistent. And there's a chance that you're not targeting that muscle anymore. And an example would be the classic bicep curl, right? How many times have we seen people do bicep curls and they swing the whole arm, they swing the whole body. And the movement is probably closer to like an Olympic clean, getting ready to clean and jerk than it is a bicep curl because they're throwing the whole body into it, right? Hmm. So then you start to wonder, okay, is that biceps muscle, you know, the biceps brachii, right? That is that muscle getting all the stimulus or are you using your forearms, your deltoids, 
like your shoulders, your pecs, your chest muscle, and then your hips as well. Are you using your calves to do this, this bicep curl um, where the bicep is, you know, doing maybe 10% of the effort. So then you go, okay, is it better to go slightly lighter so that you can get more of a stimulus in terms of total, you know, kilos of stimulus or force units of force on that muscle? And I would say, yes, it's probably better to go, um, you know, what we call kind of slightly lighter um, so that you can focus on your techniques so that you can repeat the technique, focusing that force on the bicep than it is to go, you know, potentially heavier. That's where we get into problems of, you know, maybe ego lifting, right? You don't want to go heavier because, you know, you may be embarrassed that you can only bicep curl five kilos. You want to grab the 20 kilo ones because that's what all the bros are doing. Um, and because what will happen is if you do go heavier, grab the 20 kilos, you're likely going to recruit other muscle groups to complete that movement. Um, and then, you know, you may get into this state of plateauing because your bicep isn't getting that stimulus and you're being limited by other muscle groups to see progress. Whereas if you were to focus purely on the bicep, the progression that you get, you can be certain that it's coming from the bicep and not coming from a limiting factor, such as your calf not being strong enough to be able to do more of a bicep curl, okay? Uh, so I would go for, uh, as far as to say that maybe some of the techniques that these bodybuilders were using in the past might not be super effective. Maybe they were using other strategies like, they were going a little bit heavier to eccentrically load a muscle. Sure, great. That's a, that's a strategy that you could be using, um, but you may find it more effective and find more consistent gains by having a technique that's repeatable, has a clear start and end position. You know, it doesn't bounce off uh, soft tissue and connected tissue and you know, it doesn't use momentum so that you can know for certain that you know, your bicep is doing the bicep curl and not some other muscles in your body doing that, that bicep curl. True. And also like bless the, the bodybuilders from old school. A lot of a lot of guys from then have quite a few injuries and things um, that they they probably still have to work through um, if they're still training. So that's the other thing to think of. Like it might have been good viewing, but where are they now? Yeah. And I'm not trying to be mean because that's their lives and they loved it and dedicated everything to it. But yeah, just for longevity, especially yeah. if you're not like a pro bodybuilder and you don't get paid to do it and it's not like your thing, yeah. then I wouldn't be risking it. Yeah. And I would also go far as far to say like, you know, let's, let's consider that like 80, 20 principle, like the things that you might've seen old bodybuilders do, right? Like the, the videos, Hey, that might've been the 20% of stuff that they did. Maybe they did it because of the camera was there. Maybe they did it as like the, at the end of their session, maybe as that little burnout or something like that. You know, you may be surprised that the, the 80%, the bulk of what bodybuilders were doing was like the super simple, almost boring stuff using quotation marks, marks where, you know, it was that super controlled bicep curl, you know, like the classic Arnie doing his concentration curls where, you know, no other muscle is moving except that bicep, only the elbow joint is moving in the entire body. Okay, great. That's 80% of it. But then maybe that 20% at the end was using a little bit of momentum, you know, trying to get that really big stimulus on the, the, the bicep. Sure. Okay. Maybe that, that might've been a, an example used. So mm. I'll go as far to say as like, it could be a useful strategy towards the end but the bulk of your training should be you know very uh, uh machine like right not using machines as in machines in the gym but you know a machine where it's just a, a uniform back and forwards okay we know we're confident we're consistent with our our movement pattern okay because mm. um, that goes a long way because like i was mentioning about injuries uh you know those kind of momentum based um exercises um have a really high risk of injury because each repetition is different, right? You can't be completely certain that each rep is exactly the same, that you're targeting the same structures. Each rep is slightly different. So, you know, one rep you're loading through the shoulder joint, the next rep you're loading through the wrist joint, the next rep, you know, you feel that tension in like that low back, you know, each rep is different. So your body doesn't really get a chance to adapt and grow to this stimulus. And there's a chance that you tip over and, you know, crush the giraffe, like I was saying earlier, because mm -hmm. you're loading a tissue structure that isn't ready to be loaded with force. Even though you're doing a bicep curl, you know, you could be loading through that, that low back, which isn't ready for it, which is taking too much load. And yeah, that giraffe is just going to come tumbling down. Do you think the podcast could be called Crushing the Giraffe? We're today? going to have to name it Crushing the Giraffe. That's it. Yeah. Or maybe How <laughs> to Crush the Giraffe. Because, you know, some people want to crush the giraffe if you're a little bit sadistic like that. That's cool. No, 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 uh, you know, judgment here. But How to Crush the Giraffe. Is, <laughs> that's it. We're set. 
I think it'll get the most listens out of all of them. <laughs> like, what is the giraffe? Yeah, that I poor know. giraffe has made, made himself famous. But look, Nick, <laughs> let's wrap it up there for episode number 56, 56 of the Challenge Weekly Show. If you like this episode, check out our 55 other episodes and we'll catch you next week for episode number 57. Well done, everyone. See you soon. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you like the show, share it with a friend. Or leave us a review on iTunes to spread the good word. See you next time.